I am Ashish Malik. Um, I'm a new lecturer at the School of Biological Sciences here in, at the University of Aberdeen. I joined last year in November. Um, previously, I was at University of California, Irvine, and before that at the Center for Ecology and Hydrology in Wallingford. Um, and much of the work that I'm presenting here was done there. Uh, with some strong foundations laid um, at the Max Planck Institute for Biogeochemistry in Germany, where I did my PhD research. Um, I, my group here um, at the University of Aberdeen focuses on understanding um, the mechanisms of soil carbon cycling uh, with the focus on understanding microbial diversity and physiology. Um, and how, how this is impacted by um, anthropogenic influences um, like land use change or climate change factors and how the microbes in turn shape the environment around them. And uh, my research focuses um, on understanding some um, key uh, aspects of ecosystem processes which are then linked to um, societal challenges such as climate change resilience, uh, sustainable agriculture, um, or e natural habitat restoration with a particular focus on peatlands um, here in Scotland. So to kickstart, um, just a little bit of background on carbon cycling in terrestrial ecosystems. Um, we know from our textbook biology knowledge that plants fix carbon dioxide using energy from sunlight. Um, and once they fix carbon, um, the plant organic matter is then available uh, to soil, is then it, it returned to the, to the environment below ground in the form of leaf or root litter, but also in the form of root exudates, which are nice juicy substances that plants secrete um, in the, into the soil. But below ground, microbes take the center stage. So they are at the center of below ground carbon cycling. Um, and uh, it what, what, what the microorganisms do is that they break down the organic matter and they convert it into um, convert it into uh, microbial biomass. And some of the new research suggests that most of the soil organic matter, which is the, the, the soil humus, is mostly remains of microbial dead matter and it's not plant remains. So in that sense, microorganisms are contributing massively to below ground carbon cycling. And in terms of the carbon budget, um, if you look at how much of carbon exists in the soils below, uh, you can see here, this is uh, gigatons of carbon. It's, it's more than the amount of carbon in all the plants on the earth and the atmosphere put together. Um, and this shows you um, how big the soil carbon pool is. But in addition to that, it's also a very dynamic pool. So there are, there are fluxes that can alter the balance between the atmosphere and soil. And, and because of this reason, it's very key to study the below ground carbon cycling. Um, because in future, um, this balance can be affected in a big way. And we know that what fossil fuels um, are, are they're, they're carbon basically in the deep um, earth and human activities are leading to um, an increase in CO2 in the atmosphere, which is causing an imbalance in the, in the, in the environment. So global warming is leading to climate change and it's affecting the whole carbon cycle. But in terms of agriculture, historical land use 
um, there are some estimates that about 133 gigatons of carbon was lost due to agricultural land use. And this is, this is since agriculture began as a practice. And this is equal to the amount of carbon that's been lost through uh, deforestation. So it's as big um, a loss. And if we look, look at this uh, in terms of the budgets, you can see that it's a massive amount. And it's not just a legacy of the past, but in the past, like in the past distance, like contemporary history, since um, this data from the Global Footprint Network is from the 60s, suggests an, a rapid increase in the carbon footprint coming from cropland and zing land. So agricultural practices are contributing to carbon as in addition to the fossil fuels, which are obviously um, a massive um, contribution to the carbon footprint across the, across the world. So this suggests that land use um, change is also an important factor which needs to be considered uh, while planning strategies for climate change mitigation. And how do microbes come into picture? Um, soil microbes, they as gatekeepers of the soil atmosphere carbon exchange. So plants fix carbon and then much of the plant matter is, is food for microorganisms. Um, once they have access to this, they, they, they use it to grow or they use it for other maintenance purposes. Like if there is, there is stress in the environment, they use it to alleviate that stress. If there are not main, that if there's not much food in the environment, so for them, uh, for, for heterotrophic crops, it's mostly uh, organic matter that comes from plants is the resource. So if, if there are limited resources, then they have to produce a lot of extracellular enzymes or to discover resources, they have to be mobile. So in order to reach the resource, so all these, all these activities then um, leads to lower growth because, because there is limited supply of resources. And when there are resources, they have to allocate either for one strategy or the other. So it's at the expense of the other, which means that there are trade-offs in some of these strategies. And once microbes grow and then they die, so it's a rapid turnover, microbial life is, is, is very short. Um, the dead micro, microbial biomass, which we often call micromass, then associates itself with the minerals in the soil and that forms soil organic matter. And some of the newer research in the last decade or so suggests that most of the soil organic matter is um, a result of this uh, necromass interaction with the mineral fraction in soils. So what my research does is it looks at some of these important traits um, of microbes um, and, and we, we we have these huge data sets of microbes based on newer sequencing technologies, which, which is allowing us to um, improve our understanding of microbial processes. There's a lot of information. So my trait-based approach is trying to distill that information so that we, uh, we make meaningful um, linkages to environmental processes like soil carbon sequestration. So to give an example of how the straight based approach has been applied, uh, this is a study that was done during my postdoc at the Center for Ecology and Hydrology in Wallingford in Oxfordshire. Um, and here we sampled soils from the UK, uh, 28 sites, and each site had a local land use contrast. So often it was and over the fence or next to each other contrast of a pristine habitat, mostly an undisturbed grassland or, um, or, or a grassland which has been, um, the intensity is very low 
and next to that is an agricultural cropland, often with tillage, uh, fertilization, grazing, um, or all of the above. Uh, this uh, local contrast meant that we could really understand the, the impact of the land management on the microbial processes and the soil carbon processes, um, while keeping the climate and the parent material same. So that uh, that meant that these paired contrasts were really good um, experimental treatments for us to look at the microbial responses to land, land management. And what we measured here was um, community carbon use efficiency, which CUE, which is on the y-axis here. Um, so each of the soil was used for, for these measurements. Um, and community carbon use efficiency is the growth yield of the community. Um, so what we do here is we give the microbial community a, a substrate that's labeled with the heavier isotope of carbon. So that's 13 carbon. Um, and, and then we track that 13C into the microbial DNA, into the microbially respired carbon dioxide. And this allows us to understand um, the microbial partitioning of carbon into growth versus maintenance respiration. So, so if microbes are more efficient, the carbon use efficiency is higher. So that means they are allocating more into growth processes. And we also measured the enzyme uh, investment. So here we measured the extracellular enzyme production. Um, and this was per unit biomass. And we measured a couple of enzymes using the fluorometric assays. So what we do is we add a substrate for a particular enzyme. And if there is more of that enzyme produced by the community, then more of that substrate is broken down and you get higher fluorescence. Um, so if we have higher enzyme production in terms of potential activity, then we see um, a higher enzyme activity per unit biomass. And that means microbes are investing more into food acquisition. So how, how, how does the result look here? So we have, a, we have a nice distribution of all our samples taken from all these sites with paired land use contrasts. Um, and there's not a linear relationship, but there is a somewhat um, logarithmic relationship here. And, and then, as you can see here, that increasing enzyme investment means decreasing carbon use efficiency. Um, in other words, if microbes are investing more into resource acquisition, that means they are not growing that well, that they are not investing that much into biosynthesis and growth. Production. And as you can see here, I've labeled the points with the, sh they're shaded, um, and that is actually the soil organic carbon concentration. So what we see here is that the darker um, shade are the are the soils coming from more pristine habitats, and the the lighter are coming from more um, intensive habitats, so the agricultural cropland soils. And as you can see here, that they are investing a lot into um, they're investing a lot into um, resource acquisition, whereas there is more growth happening in the more pristine soils. I say pristine because they are not really pristine. We hardly have nat completely natural habitats here. So they are less intensive land, land use uh, soils. So we, we see here clearly that in 
in the more natural habitats, the microbial communities have good amount of resources available to them because here we are not taking away the plant material for food production, for example, or um, in, in grazed, um, in grazed uh, land use, it's taken away by animals, um, livestock. But um, the microbes have enough food there, so they're investing. They don't need to in produce a lot of extracellular enzymes. They just need some transporters to suck those easily available uh, resources, substrates into the cell. And therefore, they grow really well. Um, and this is then seen in terms of growth yield. And when you have a higher growth yield, it translates into higher, carb higher soil carbon accumulation, storage, and sequestration. So the idea of using soil carbon sequestration to mitigate climate change is not that new. Um, this was um, a review by Ratan Lal in 2004, um, where some of these carbon management strategies were, were first coined. Um, but then um, in the last decade or so, we have in, in, improved our understanding of soil carbon cycling processes, and we now know that microbial uh, derived organic matter formation is a very important process in soils. So this paper here by Kallenbach et al. Um, in 2006 is a, is a very good demonstration of, uh, of microbes producing soil organic matter. So they used soil which were carbon and microbe free, and then they added um, a microbial community to that, to, to, to these, to these soils. And they also added some dissolved organic matter as, as inputs of, um, of organic matter for the microbial communities. And they tracked these soils in the, in the lab for about 15 months, and they could see build up organic matter. So soils being made in the in the laboratory. This is a classical example of how microbes are contributing uh, to soil organic matter formation, and this is mostly through growth and death cycles. So since then, there's been an increasing realization, um, not just among sci the scientific community, but this has been uh, taken up by a lot of stakeholders, policymakers, and even a lot of farmers now realize the importance of microbes in soil, not just in terms of carbon sequestration, but improving soil health as a whole. Um, if, there are, if, the, if there is more carbon storage in soil, it also improves the soil physical characteristics. Um, there's more aggregation. There's also more nutrients available to the plants. Uh, so there, it is a win-win um, in, in some sense. And so, so my take home or rather my keep home message, uh, because we are all at home right now, is um, that microbial growth and death cycles feed soil organic matter. And that, and they really need to understand microbial processes and how, how they are shaped by resource inputs, but also abiotic stresses that, that are arising because of changing climate um, with, it, with increased incidences of droughts and floods um, and extreme, um, extreme events. So it's, it's really important to understand these processes that are leading to formation of soil organic matter. Uh, but from, from what we know so far, um, it's, it's very likely that increasing plant inputs and reducing stress in soils will enhance um, microbes. Um, in, in, and, and that actually then is um, leading to higher soil carbon storage and sequestration. So in terms, this is not just important um, as a climate change mitigation factor, but it's also, so not just to keep carbon in the ground, but there is also potential to increase soil carbon because 
we have large swathes of soils where um, they, they are they're degraded. The carbon content is very low. So there's a, there's a large amount of potential there to improve um, soil carbon um, in those soils without impacting um, yields, crop yields very significantly, because eventually we do need food um, to uh, feed the growing human population. So some of the hum sustainable land use strategies should uh, involve um, some of these microbiome mediated solutions um, because that's allowing us to improve soil health, but also to mitigate climate change. With that, I'd like to um, thank um, funding agencies that made this much of this work possible. Uh, primarily the European Commission for the Marie Curie Fellowship, but also um, Natural Environment Research Council here in the UK uh, for the grant uh, which supported much of this work. Um, and I'd also like to thank my postdoc advisors um, in my previous affiliations uh, at the University of California, Irvine, Center for Ecology and Hydrology, and the Max Planck for Biogeochemistry. Um, my contact details are here below, uh, and I'd like to thank you um, for listening and joining today. I'm happy to take questions um, and discuss further. Great. I just want to say thank you very much, Ashish, for presenting today. Um, and likewise, thank you to everyone for joining. So if you do have any questions, if you're able to type them in the chat message, the chat box, then I'd be happy to read them out. Oh, I can see Aftab that you've raised your hand. Um, if you are able to click on the kind of bottom right of your screen, there's a kind of purple icon and in there you can then open the chat and then you can write a message if, if you're wanting to ask something. Um, oh, okay, sorry. If, you, if you're able to try now, and then that should be work. So we've got a question from Richard Blackmore it's asking, how great is the potential contribution of increased soil carbon sequestration in helping the UK achieve carbon net zero? Yeah, so like I mentioned towards the end, um, it's uh, the there are a lot of um, the swathes of um, soils in the UK where uh, the, the amount of carbon is really low. And this is because of severe de degradation through years and decades of very intensive farming. So there is, there is an immediate potential there to increase um, carbon sequestration without massively impacting um, crop yields, uh, for example, because this is this is um, not a massive investment um, because it's so degraded. So in that sense, um, that can help us um, offset some of the some of the um, carbon footprints that are generated, generally speaking. 
Thank you. And um, there's a question from Adam. Hello, Adam, who was presenting earlier. Uh, what kind of intervention might a farmer do to improve soil carbon via microbes? said there are basically two requirements here. One is increasing inputs because we are taking away their food. So various forms of sustainable farming strategies have been tried. Some of them are like uh, involving cover crops. Some of them have organic amendments added. So some of these strategies could be useful because they are helping feed the microbes. Um, so that's one of the strategies. And the other strategy is reducing the stress because some of some of the soils are so degraded that they are very stressful for microorganisms. It's almost like a drought to them in normal conditions because soils are not being retained there. They are heavily degraded soils. So by building organic matter through microbes, we are also helping the microbes again uh, because that's improving the soil structure and reducing the stress. So it's it's a reiterative process. It's a feedback that feeds and keeps giving. So by improving organic matter, it's also reducing the soil because then soils can hold the water together. And that means overall, it's a less stressful environment for microbes. So I would say two things which are both limited food for microbes and reducing stress for microbes, eventually helping them to uh, keep more carbon in the ground. Great. And there is a question from Albert who said, thank you very much for this session. I'm wondering how this research is communicated to modern farmers and how successful that has been. Yeah, so some of my work does involve uh, talking to farmers. Some of some of the samples that we've collected are coming from farmers, um, or they are coming from associations with um, certain some conservation trusts that are actively engaged in in devising or designing some of these new sustainable land management strategies. So. Our work is helping them in understanding if those strategies are successful in ascertaining the success of some of these newer technologies. So this is one way the interaction happens is that they are trying those strategies. We are looking if those are helping the microbes, if those are helping other organisms in the soil. Uh, not just microbes. And is it helping us to sequester carbon? Is it helping us to improve the nutrient um, uh, content of the soil? Because that then helps the plants um, as well. And then, so so these uh, interactions are important and it's happening. Um, and I'm now writing more proposals to get funding from the government. And some of these um, are in active collaboration with the stakeholders like farmers and policymakers of in the agricultural se sector. So I think and, and I'd like to say that some of the farmers are really um, in tune with some of the latest research and they are actively seeking more information to um, improve, um, improve soil health. And our next question is, have you done any soil analysis of the grouse moors of Aberdeenshire? Not yet, but that's um, one of the projects I'd like to get get on with. Um, actually, there is a PhD student um, in Aberdeen who's trying to look at some of the controlled burns and how they are impacting vegetation. Um, and I was hoping to get on board and look at some of the below ground processes. We will eventually do it. It was cancelled for this year uh, because of COVID-19. But that's one of the projects I'm trying to get on board with, um, trying to look at how some of these moors can be used to improve carbon sequestration. And what is also the impact of some of these burns, controlled burns on, um, on the moors? 
Uh, our next one is from Tom, who says, thank you for your presentation. Does the type or quality of plant material that we apply to soil matter for carbon use efficiency and carbon sequestration, or is it just a case of more, more I think it's the more the better? Yeah, so yeah, this is a great question. Um, there is there is a lot of science um, around the, the the quality of the organic matter in terms of the carbon and nitrogen content. So often we use the ratios um, of CNN, but also in terms of what the what the organic matter is made of. Are there a lot of aromatic compounds or a lot of lipids, or what are the carbohydrates that are present there? Uh, this is also important, but I think the the primary case is that we are just taking away all the organic matter and the microbes are left with no um, resources. So the so the primary concern would obviously be the be inputs, uh, but obviously there are some inputs that are very useful, uh, and if they are less labile in the sense that they are more coming in in uh, in regular periods, then it's better for the microbes than um, than some very labile uh, material like say compost um, um, that's that can be very uh, triggering for microbes in certain sense. And our next one is from Key saying, nice talk. How do you think the contribution of autotropic microbes in soil to soil organic carbon accumulation? Yeah, this is also a fascinating line of research. Um, uh, we don't know much about this, but there are some indicators that they do matter. Um, microbes um, that fix carbon, just like plants do. Um, yeah, I, to be honest, I don't know much about the exact um, contribution, um, but most of the community in soils is heterotrophic. Um, which is relying on other sources of organic matter. So I'd expect the contribution uh, to be low, if not insignificant. Our next question is from Aftab, who says, has there been any studies conducted to quantify the soil carbon loss due to urban planning? Do we know how much of C we lose on average against urban development? Yeah, this is also not um, not a very well developed field of research, but there is uh, there is some science going on. I'm not very much aware of this, but I'm sure this is massively impacting carbon. Uh, it it may well be that it's positive. It's a it's a positive contribution in some, some sense, but I have no idea. Um, this is this is basically almost like shutting off that um that interface between the the soils and and the atmosphere right so this could be this could be very uh, extreme environments um, in some sense but yeah this is this is a very interesting point and there should be more research done on that okay our next question is are soils poor in organic matter the best candidates for carbon sequestration practices Yeah, I, I say this because um, because the the sequestration happens because of aggregation, mic, uh, organic organo mineral interactions. So interactions of the organic matter with the minerals, and the organic matter is often um, some sort of necromass product from microbes. Um, so w I say that soils which are degraded are the best candidates because these mineral um, um, points are available for sequestration. Whereas once you once you start building organic matter through those organo mineral interactions, the sites that are available decrease, um, and some some uh, soils reach. Um, a, a threshold beyond which they cannot really uh, there are there are no more uh, sites available for for that organic matter to bind onto minerals. Um, so that's why I say that uh, there is a lot more potential 
for soils which are severely degraded because um, microbes, if if they are given a chance to grow and survive and thrive, they can they can easily um, build organic matter. Our next question is from Bob asking, how destructive is ploughing to organic matter reduction? Uh, very much so, um, and and a lot of these these um, a lot of the me mechanisms for loss of carbon are physical and chemical, and and that, that has very little to do with microbial processes. So, when we go from a nice, rich organ uh, you know organic rich soils to a degraded soil. It's mostly because of tillage and all these intensive practices which expose the organic matter to degradation, be it microbial, biological, or chemical, or physical. But the, the process in the other direction is largely microbial. So going from degraded back to rich soils, is, is, it's largely microbial. Um, and, and that's why I'm saying that there is a significant potential there to mitigation. Um, but if you want to prevent loss, it's some of these strategies that have to be minimized. Um, but if you want to build organic matter, then it's the biology that rules. And our next question comes from Mary. Um, can you uh, please explain what you mean by increasing plant inputs? I assume you don't mean standard fertilizers. No, what I what I mean is generally um, how it how plant soil interactions happen is plants give my um, give out root exudates into the soil, and it's often for their own benefit. They form interactions with arbuscular mycorrhizal fungi. They have a lot of um, microbes in the rhizosphere, which are actually aiding in their growth, a helping them fight pathogens, and so these root exudates are important. But also when plants um, give, uh, they because of leaf fall or just even root litter when plants die or when they senesce, all that organic material is available for microbes. Um, but in 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 an agricultural setting, what we are doing is we are maximizing crop yield, we are maximizing food production, so we are not really thinking about the whole system which is feeding the plants as well. We are only looking at uh, how best to get the fruits, um, how best to get the grains or the seeds. Um, so that's why I'm saying that we need to return to some of those, um, some of those natural equilibrium processes. And that's why plant matter inputs are important. Rather than taking away everything, some of it could be left. Obviously it's a big investment, but um, but if it helps to keep soil health, um, that is one of the strategies to um, to employ. Yeah, it's not fertilizers because that's just bypassing the whole um, process of acquiring nutrients uh, for plants, and it's not not helping in the in the long run to improve soil health. All right. Next question is from Bill. Um, with regard to maintained landscaped areas. Would leaving leaf fall slash grass cuttings in situ improve microbial action and carbon sequestration? Absolutely, yes. Um, that's why um, I leave some of my grass when it's cut back there so that the microbes have food um, as well. And do we have, oh, yes, we've got another question. Um, from AFTAB, uh, do the green space management practices affect soil carbon, for example, grass, uh, cutting grass? Yes, um, so like I just mentioned, um, a lot of these, um, yeah, a lot of landscaping uses a lot of water um, and we are, um, yeah, it's it's a disturbed environment, in, so to speak. Um, and yes, cutting grass, we are taking all the organic matter away then, 
and it's it's disturbing the balance of the, the of those plant soil interactions that I that I just talked about. Um, so to improve organic matter in the lawns, um, in the green spaces, uh, we would have to return some of that organic matter back to the soil. Okay, and we just had a few more questions. So, um, why do tropical soils with low organic matter still produce good crops? Ah, that's an interesting question. Um, I would argue maybe that the mineral nutrition is better there, um, but I'm not very sure. Sorry about that. Our next one is, can more diverse plant communities result in more carbon sequestration? Um, yes, there is there is uh, plenty of evidence uh, from biodiversity experiments on that. Um, uh, some of the, some of the big experiments going on in Germany or in the US um, show that pretty well. Um, um, diverse plant communities give give um, diverse root exudates um, or root litter. So there is also a diverse substrate um, available to the diverse community in, in such environments. Um, so yes, um, they do help um, carbon sequestration. I actually have um, a paper that was published in 2016, which shows just that. And our next one is from Hir Darlu, who says, thank you for the presentation. Thinking on strategies for CO2 reduction, do you know if there is any international project or initiative aimed at the use of degraded soils for CO2 sequestration? Yes, the classical example is the French initiative of um, four per mil. Um, um, if you if you look up a uh, four per mil initiative, um, that will uh, link you to the to the project um, that's actually trying to uh, increase um, carbon sequestration in some of the most degraded soils. And are there any more questions? Just give it a minute or two. Yeah, I just want to add that the EU is also trying to really ramp up um, their funding on soil health and improving carbon sequestration. So um, it's not it's not yet funded, but uh, some of the newer uh, funding uh, programs like the Horizon Europe is, uh, for example, trying to target um, um, research that's that will be primarily aimed at improving soil health, carbon sequestration. Cool. Our next one is actually a question that I can answer. Um, so after the presentation is actually, okay, Nicole's just typed it. We're, we're recording this, so we will to share that with you if you missed some of it. Um, and the next question is from Mary. Uh, for best carbon sequestration, how often should I mow my lawn? I have left it unmowed. <laughs> I am not very sure about this. Um, um, yeah, I wouldn't. This this would be a great experiment, actually. Um, so, leaving it unmoaned um, will feed root exudates, um, and when it's senescent, it will give up. Um, give up carbon better. And there's, there's some indication from some of the research um, that grazing actually improves root exudation because um, the grass sort of dies and regenerates. So then it can um, uh, keep growing roots. But then there's also other indication that when you cut the grass, um, you're actually uh, stopping that flow so I'm not really sure based on some of the scientific evidence that happens, but I think this will be a great experiment, particularly from the science communication point of view. So thanks, Mary. And 
there's another question. Um, is there a potential for research to look at some of the urban development sites and qualify the carbon loss? Oh, yeah. Definitely. Oh, quantify, sorry. Yes. Yeah. This is definitely um, an area where not much research has been done. So this is definitely um, a place where there is plenty of potential. Great. I'll again give it a minute because every time I think I've said, is there any more questions? There has been. So I'll just wait and see if anyone types. So I just shared the link to the full Permel initiative, um, which is trying to um, improve uh, soil health in particularly degraded soils. And this is, um, like I said, um, mostly driven by the French government. And Aftab's just asked, would you be happy to be involved in such a project? Yes. Just need to get that set up now. <laughs> <laughs> Okay, um, if there are any further questions, obviously just type them. Um, Aftab's just said, thanks, I will contact you then. Um, I will leave that as a discussion between the two of you. Um, but yeah, thank you so much for presenting today and for answering all those questions. Apologies if my pronunciation of things were not perfect. Um, and I think you can kind of see there's some requests for contact details. Um, obviously, we've shared the recording. There's some information on that. Um, if the email address is there, then I can share that in the email that we'll send to everyone afterwards. Um, but yeah, so thank you to Ashish and thank you to um, everyone for joining us today. Um, I especially think I recognize a couple of names who were here with us this morning. So um, thanks to everyone who's joined us for both sessions as well. And yes. Thank you very much enjoy. for having me. No, no problem. Um, so yeah, I hope everyone enjoys their evening and has a great weekend when it comes. <laughs>